Northern Lights, a look at Minnesota books and writers, is presented by the Minnesota Center for the Book, a program of the Minnesota Humanities Commission, with funding provided by Target Stores and the Elmer L. and Eleanor J. Anderson Foundation. Welcome to Northern Lights. I'm Ted Genoways, poet and editor at the Minnesota Historical Society Press, and it's my pleasure today to interview Robert Bly, poet, essayist, translator, editor, literary gadfly, uh, and Minnesota's godfather uh, of literature. Uh, it's especially my pleasure today to be able to interview you here, Robert, in your in your writing studio, and thank you thank for you. having us here. Thank you. <clears throat> One of the, the the pleasures and excuses that we have for um, talking to you tonight about your new book, the the night Abraham called to the stars, is the the Minnesota Book Award uh, nomination for the book. It's a book of guzzles. Um, would you explain for the for the viewers what a what a guzzle is, and talk a little bit about the history of the form? Sure. A guzzle is really the oldest um, literary form among the Muslims. It was begun by the Arabs in about the 10th century as a love poem. And gradually, when uh, Persia became a part of the emperor, empire and um, Egypt and so on, it began to change. And now it is a form in which uh, each um, stanza, which is about 36 syllables, is an independent poem. So that forces you to shift your subject matter from one stanza to the next. Um, so it's very interesting because the poet does say three stanzas and no one knows what is holding this thing together. Um, and they, you know, there's like watching someone dive. <laughs> Are they going to hit <laughs> that tank or not? And um, so therefore there's more work for the reader to do. So the first poem that you want me to read is really more straightforward, but the others will be more in the guzzle form. Okay. Well, why don't you read, read for us the, the opening poem? Well, the opening poem is called The Night Abraham Called to the Stars. And one could say that in the long history of the human race, when they, they try to understand what God is, the moment when human beings understood that the stars were not God is given to Abraham. And in the Quran, he says, in fact, that. He talks to the planets and says, if you set, I will not believe that you're God. Well, they set. Do you remember the night Abraham first called to the stars? He cried to Saturn, you are my Lord. How happy he was. When he saw the dawn star, he cried, you are my Lord. How destroyed he was when he watched them set. Friends, he is like us. We take as our Lord the stars that go down. We are faithful companions to the unfaithful stars. We are diggers like badgers. We love to feel the dirt flying out from behind our hind claws. And no one can convince us that mud is not beautiful. It is our badger soul that thinks so. We are ready to spend the rest of our life walking with muddy shoes in the wet field. We resemble exiles in the kingdom of the serpent. We stand in the onion fields looking up at the night. My heart is a calm potato by day and a weeping abandoned woman by night. Friends, tell me what to do since I am a man in love with the setting stars. 
So it's strange at the end. I mean, does that say that <laughs> uh, I'm a man in love with the setting stars? I mean, that means I'm a farm kid, and I love to be out there in, uh, in sunset when all these things are happening and everything is turning dark. But when I was reading it, I thought, what does that mean? Does that mean that, <laughs> that I'm not <laughs> like Abraham? Or what does that mean? I'm a man in love with the setting stars. Well, I think some people really love eternity and uh, brilliance and uh, constant movement upward. And um, I'm not that sort of a person. T tell us a little bit, of the, the, this poem and, and, and so many of the poems in the book are really wide-ranging in their subject matter. And, and as you said, e each of the, the stanzas in the guzzle is, is meant to be its own poem. And so it, it gives itself over to that sort of, that wide-ranging um, approach. Well, it's very interesting because the typical poem in English will be like, uh, say, Robert Frost's uh, poem, uh, Something There Is That Doesn't Love a Wall. And then it stays exactly with that, and he goes down, and finally this neighbor and his are putting up a wall, and so on and so on, and the whole thing is clear right to the end. And you learn a lot about walls. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you learn a lot about Frost, too. But but in this poem, um, if it's really about walls, walls will hardly be mentioned, or it won't be mentioned till the last stanza. And uh, so the question that comes in, uh, how do you want to move to the next stanza? If you begin with nature, do you want to go to God with the next stanza? Do you want what I often do is to go to history something in history. And uh, one reason is because we're forgetting all our history. People hardly, you know, people don't even know uh, anymore who Heraclitus is or anything. So therefore, there's something, a, a shock that comes in in the way when I bring in people from history. And then I've done a lot of reading in my life. Why should I waste all of that? Why not put <laughs> one of them in? <laughs> and, uh, and then events that have happened to you can go in. You know, and what I like about it is that you can talk about your life and events in your life. You'll see a, in this poem, you'll see a reference. But you don't have to keep on with that. If you start talking about an event in your life, a sad one, and you keep on going, it becomes a confessional poem. Mm -hmm. But here you can talk without it becoming a confessional poem. So you want me to do the Monet poem? Sure, please. And uh, I actually saw this um, painting of Monet, uh, he did haystacks, you know, in the fall, in the spring, he did them in the summer, he did them, you know, in the winter when there was snow on them, and I saw one of those in the new museum in um, Los Angeles, and I was absolutely stunned at the fantastic beauty of that work. So it indicates that we can create great art in this century, there's no doubt about it. It's as good as Rembrandt. So it's called Monet's Haystacks, and I've been thinking about beauty. So the first line says, It's strange that our love of beauty should lead us to hell. I caught one glimpse of you, and a moment later my house and books were all thrown into the fire. So that's the end of that. Plato wrote by the light from shark's teeth. There's always terror near the quiet garden. If we've come to a bad end, let's blame beauty. Third stanza. The horses of sorrow are always restless, breaking out of fences, trampling the neighbor's garden. The best odes are written by pirates in the moonlight. When Monet glimpsed the haystack shining in fall dawn, knowing that despair and reason live in the same house, he cried out, I have loved God, and he had. I'll do that again. When Monet glimpsed the haystack shining in fall dawn, knowing that despair and reason live in the same house, he cried out, I have loved God. And he had. I walked down the aisles of the grocery weeping. Gleams of light came off my hair when I saw you, and I found myself instantly under the horse's hooves. Last stanza. My improvidence was to have been too hopeful. My improvidence was not to see the fall. 
I apologize to those in hell for my disturbances. I'll do the last stanza again, because <laughs> the more you write, you realize how fantastic English is, <laughs> that um, you can say, I apologize to those in hell, and then suddenly the mode of English can change. My improvidence was to have been too hopeful. My improvidence was not to see the fall. I apologize to those in hell for my disturbances. <laughs> and I apologize to those in hell is so huge. And, and then my disturbances are so little. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> How did you come to the guzzle form yourself? Tell us a little bit about your, your translation and, and how, um, I'm thinking specifically of some of the translations you've done of Ghalib and how those might have affected your, your interest in the guzzel. Well, you know, strange thing how things happen, you know. They seem to happen by total accident, things. I found some poems of Rumi and, and I talked uh, Coleman into doing some of those. Some of those were guzzles. And then I found uh, Hafez, who's an absolute and total genius in the guzzle. I mean, no one even comes near him. So, but, uh, but that was uh, 1300 or so, and everyone has continued to write the guzzle. And in India, the most famous of all of the recent poets in India is a man named Ghalib, who wrote guzzles. So uh, I knew Hafez from a distance, and I knew Rumi okay. But then one of my daughters married a man from India, uh, Sunil Dutta. And when he came over to this country, he was a biologist, he said to me, uh, let's translate Ghalib into English. I said, no way. <laughs> you out of your mind. I've been translating Norwegian, Swedes, and everything for years, Spaniards, and this is enough. But if they're in the family, you know, what can you do? <laughs> so we did this book of Ghalib, and it cost, uh, cost us four years. Um, and Ghalib is very, very saucy. He says things like, um, their funeral date is already decided, and still people complain they can't sleep. <laughs> so what he does is, is give in each stanza. Sometimes it'll be his own. His own, he, he loved to drink a little bit. So he was a, a, not really a great Muslim from that point of view. <laughs> and one time he was brought up uh, when uh, the English uh, attacked uh, Calcutta and Delhi, I think it was, and he was brought up and uh, in, in interviewed by an English colonel uh, with a lot of the other people who were educated in town trying to find out if they were all terrorists or not, as Bush would say. And so uh, he, everyone else was afraid and came in, you know, very cautiously. Ghalib came in dressed in red and yellow, wearing a conical hat. And the English colonel said, are you a Muslim or Hindu? He said, I'm half a Muslim. What? How can that be? Well, I don't eat pork, but I do drink. <laughs> <laughs> and so the man said, unbelievable. <laughs> you, may, you may go. <laughs> so. So therefore, by working over this, I really had a close uh, knowledge uh, developed by this translation with my, with my son-in-law of uh, uh, how far you can leap inside one of these poems. Mm -hmm. So that was a tremendous, it came in exactly at the right moment for me. So I'm very happy about that. And then um, also, uh, Ghalib is very bold, as you can tell. Mm -hmm. And so this book is, has a certain kind of boldness in it. Which, uh, which I like. And, um, well, here's one. The ink we write with seeps in through our fingers. What we call reason is the way the parasite learns to live in the saint's intestinal tract. <laughs> now, that really doesn't make much sense. <laughs> but, th but every day, you know, when you're a writer, you're writing with ink, and I was thinking about that. I mean, that stuff is bound to get into you. The ink we write with seeps in through our fingers. Well, then, don't we use reason in school? What we call reason is the way the parasite learns to live in the saint's intestinal tract. <laughs> it's just totally zany. Anyway, 
Does that uh, answer your question? Yes, I think so. I, I wonder if you'd read for us the, the raft of green logs, which I think... Well, good. This, uh, this begins with a kind of a bold statement. Uh, everyone says, you know, poets are... They'd say to me, you've been writing poetry? Yes, you must be a very sensitive person. <laughs> I say, no, on the contrary. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, um, so there are a lot of different kinds of poets in the world besides uh, Shelley. And as you know, that wonderful poet you translate, Miguel Hernandez, mm -hmm. was a great man in the Spanish Civil War on the Republican side. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, Franco finally you know, punished him by killing him in prison. But that boldness is right all the way through in uh, Lorca and all the Spanish poetry. Uh, Pablo Neruda. Pablo Neruda ended up being the American uh, ambassador to uh, France. And the last time I saw him was in a classroom in, in um, Columbia where he was going to give a talk. And I went there. And he said, uh, he was in the Andy regime, you know. He said, tomorrow morning I'm going to go to Paris and we're going to ask for a, a loan from the World Bank for Chile. He said, I don't think we're going to get it. Then he turned to the Americans in the audience and he said, you can bring us down and you probably will. But I want you to remember that great poet you had who talked about the albatross Coleridge. If you do that, we'll be an albatross around your neck. Ooh, 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 and that turned out to be exactly true. I mean, we're partly responsible for the millions of people killed in uh, Chile during that time. So when Bush goes on around about how innocent we are, you know, I want to vomit. We've killed a lot of people. Well, anyway, go back to this poem. Uh, so the question is, are all poets very sensitive? Poetry is an occupation appropriate for slaughterers and knife wielders. <laughs> Poetry is an occupation appropriate for slaughterers and knife wielders. Life on earth needs many kills to engender the soft leaps of the cheetah. But this poem is also talking about how much cutting you have to do in a poem. You know, cutting, and that's the same word that surgeons use. Poetry is an occupation appropriate for slaughterers and knife wielders. Life on earth needs many kills to engender the soft leaps of the cheetah. God made me tender. But writing poetry with its furry herd of images that have to be saved or murdered has made me fierce. Now I'm going to have to change the subject. The Lord of this world condemns half his friends to death. Music testifies to that. Notes wave their arms and sink into the cold Atlantic. Got to change the subject. During the years I called to Rilke and Bema, I hung under small branches. I went over the waterfall, still holding the twig of reason. I was in my 20s and I lived alone in New York in a tiny little room. During the years I called to Rilke and Bema, I hung onto small branches. I went over the waterfall, still holding the twig of reason. Next stanza. It's all right if we tumble down the falls. I remember how many lambs died in the farm. Our desires reformed themselves overnight anyway. <laughs> it's all right if we tumble down the falls. I remember how many lambs died in the farm. Our desires reformed themselves overnight anyway. And the tradition is in the guzzle that in the last stanza, you come to yourself and talk about yourself. Mm -hmm. Instead of making generalization about other people, you have to see if they're true about you. Otherwise, you shouldn't be making them. So I, I did it once in a while. Here I did it. My affections were stuffed into the giant's mouth. Some marriages are rafts. I saw water between the green logs. You could not have saved me. So it's interesting in the way to be able to turn to the reader and talk to the reader and say to the reader, oh, you feel bad about this? You could not have saved me. <laughs> and that's, um, that's the first time that I'd ever done something like that in the poem. My affections were stuffed into the giant's mouth. Some marriages are rafts. 
I saw water between the green lawns. You could not have saved me. I'm glad you like that poem. It's, it's a wonderful collection. I think it's, it's a fantastic book from start to finish. I, I'm, I think that you've, you've got a number of awards in your future for oh, this you do, book, huh? I do. That's good. <laughs> Well, I do think it's the best book that I've ever done. And partly because, uh, oh, I'll tell you a strange thing. And I thought this yesterday. I was, I was giving a reading and, uh, with, some, with a musician from India, an Indian musician woman. And, um, and I said, you know, I used to think that, the, that poetry was about maybe nature. I wrote a lot of poems about wheat fields and so on. And you try to make them transparent so you can feel the fields. You know? And I said, I used to think that poetry was about nature or maybe about history. But now I think that poetry is really about language. And you just bring in the world in order to make the language more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like saying that music is about God. It isn't. It's about sounds. Right. Right. And uh, one of the ways I love uh, Indian music is the unbelievable sounds that they bring in. So incredible, back and forth and up and down. So anyway, that's my latest thought, that poetry is really about language. And because my language is the most various here, <laughs> therefore in not, it's better than some of my other ones. I've done a lot of bad poetry in my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm pleased to hear you... Uh, <coughs> mention um, having the opportunity to talk about some of your your opinions and and speak directly to the reader and, and wanted to, to bring up um, before we close with this segment the thousands the new mm -hmm. um, the new magazine that you've revived um, continuing the the 50s 60s and, and 70s um, 70s press books what uh, what inspired you to start this up again well um, <coughs> I started the 50s, which was a polemical magazine, <coughs> typical for men uh, or poets, uh, men and women of my generation. I was just reading a biography of Robert Creeley, who was ex born exactly in my uh, year. And he started by attacking everything else, just dismissing all of the poets. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I said, that's the way I was at that age. So, so uh, <coughs> therefore, we had a lot of insults in, uh, in the 50s, and I had a thing called... Um, Madame Tussauds Wax Museum, where we would take really wonderful poets that we didn't like and put them in there and uh, humiliate them in that way. So <coughs> then it went through the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, and then around 78 or so, uh, <coughs> I think I, I didn't do any more, and I became involved in many uh, other elements, including writing some prose books like uh, Iron John and so on. And then <coughs> they were going to do something for my 75th birthday here in Minneapolis. And the loft got together and uh, really supported it wonderfully. And the McKnight Foundation, to my amazement, uh, offered to print a whole another issue. So that was amazing. So we only had about a week to do in order to get it to the printer in time for the, in time for, uh, the birthday party. So, um, so uh, Bart Schneider and I put the whole thing together in a week. <laughs> and uh, luckily, I had been giving lectures in various places about, you know, six things that will help a poem get better. One was a metaphor, and another was an emphasis on sounds, different sounds. And, um, and uh, another one was that a poem has some psychic weight that will have some heaviness. So I went to my notes on those lectures and managed to put together uh, a 40-page um, thing, a 40-page essay. And then I found some old poems. Uh, by this one by Bhartra Hari, who is an Indian poet from India, about 450 A.D., that no one had ever heard of. Because I tried to put in every issue of poem that no one had ever heard of. And this one worked well. I'll read you a poem. This a mouse once gnawed a hole in a basket in which a famished snake lay sleeping. And the mouse fell into the snake's open mouth. And the snake, invigorated by this meal, crawled out through the same hole by which the mouse entered. Friends, be satisfied with your life. 
you'll never know why one person rises and another falls. Wow, I think that's fantastic. I love that. See, it's the same thing at the end. He right. talks to the reader directly. He tells this incredible story of the snake in the mouth. And he says, oh, what is going on? And then he turns and says, friends, be satisfied with your life. That's so brilliant. So I did that. And um, then, um, and then I, I had my insult was a, the Domestic Globalization Award, uh, which I said is, um, means a distribution of identical ready-made articles that result in the destruction of native cultures. And I said, this is being done by the 256 writing programs in the United States, which are turning out more and more bad poets all the time. So it's sort of a, a domestic globalization. It's very rude to say that. And there are many uh, you know, exceptions to that. There are good writing programs. But in general, things are not going very well. Then I have an essay on Jane Hirschfield, uh, who is a marvelous poet from California, uh, who has really absorbed a lot of the Buddhist material. And, at the, and all of my old essays used to be signed Crunk. But this time I said, I signed it to Bubin Adam. I said the Bubin Adam's earlier name was Crunk, but after having read a lot of Rumi, his name is now a <laughs> Bubin Adam. <laughs> so I believe it. It's, uh, I love putting out magazines of this type. And, and so uh, I got a thousand copies um, because the foundation had uh, supported it. And then I decided to print another thousand copies, uh, which I could give away myself to friends and stuff. It only cost me six, seven hundred dollars for a thousand copies. So I'm glad you enjoy seeing it. Will there be a number two? Yes, I promised one more. I, I said in here, please don't subscribe. You'll never <laughs> receive your issues anyway. <laughs> and all the old subscribers in the 50s and 60s know there's truth in that sentence. But I said, if you send me seven dollars, we'll send you the next issue. So it'll cost two dollars to mail it, and uh, so five dollars will pay for it. So I'll definitely have one more. So I'm trying to think now who I'll put in there and, and who I should insult <laughs> and so on. <laughs> well, we'll look forward to the next issue. No, and, thank you. And, and certainly look forward to, to the new poems that you're working on also. Thank you for, for having us here, Robert. And we'll be back uh, with, with part two. I hope you'll join us for part two of this interview where we'll go back and uh, revisit some of the earlier books that, that Robert has shared with us. Thank you for joining us on Northern Lights. Though poetry is written alone, not for yourself, but it's written in solitude, a poetry reading makes clear that, that the poem only lives in a community. And the sea lifts and falls all night, and the moon goes on through the unattached heavens alone. And the toe of the shoe pivots in the dusk. And the man in the black coat turns and goes back down the hill. No one knows why he came or why he turned away and did not climb the hill. Poetry in the West touches the, the human spirit and sometimes the divine spirit. But uh, there's been a great movement in poetry in the last hundred years that it also touched the earth spirit. Northern Lights, a look at Minnesota books and writers, is presented by the Minnesota Center for the Book, a program of the Minnesota Humanities Commission, with funding provided by Target Stores and the Elmer L. and Eleanor J. Anderson Foundation. Mm -hmm.